morning, everyone. I hope everybody can hear us. I think so. So I'm just going to mute this, please. There. I just wanted to have our camera here so everybody can see Dr. Laffin. So welcome, everyone, to our special rounds uh, this morning. And we're going to have an exciting presentation about hypertension. And I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Luke Laffin, who is here uh, next to me. He's a preventive cardiologist at the main campus at the Cleveland Clinic uh, Foundation in Cleveland, Ohio. And there at the Cleveland Clinic, he is the co-director of the Center for Blood Pressure Disorders and medical director for cardiac rehabilitation. He's a Canadian uh, from Alberta, but went to medical school in Vanderbilt University and then completed the rest of his training in internal medicine, cardiology, and a dedicated hypertension fellowship at the University of Chicago in Illinois. He is a cardiovascular clinical trialist with interest in emerging treatments for hypertension, lipid disorders, and obesity. Today, he will talk to us about the present and future of hypertension. And it's important that we listen closely to this because hypertension continues to be the number one cause for death and disability worldwide. So there's arguably no greater preventative intervention uh, than to prevent or control hypertension. So I'm really looking forward to let Dr. Laffin's talk today. And he really knows what he's talking about, having edited Brownwell's companion book on hypertension. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Laffin to uh, the Heart Institute, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, it's great to come here and, uh, and speak. Appreciate it, everyone. Um, so it's going to be great over this next uh, hour or so to really uh, talk about hypertension beyond 2022 paradigms um, with you. So the outline for today's talk, well, we're going to start in 2022 and think about where we are right now. Um, and then we're going to look forward um, about five years. And then at the end, even perhaps 10 years, um, looking at what's new in hypertension. So in, we'll talk about state of hypertension control, current treatment approaches. Um, and then there's all kinds of fascinating research opportunities in hypertension. Um, to uh, to talk about or that we can talk about. So there's emerging pharmacotherapies, there's device-based management for hypertension, there's digital and AI strategies for hypertension management. We could talk about population level interventions for blood pressure awareness and hypertension control. And each of these unto themselves would be a conference on its own. Um, but what I really wanna focus on um, for today's talk is emerging pharmacotherapies for hypertension management. Um, so as many of us know, um, blood pressure control is not getting better throughout the world. It's generally getting worse. And this is particularly true in the United States. Um, so this was a study published back um, just a couple of years ago, looking at trends in blood pressure control um, from the late 90s, early 2000s, up through 2017, 2018. Um, and this was using a 140 over 90 definition of hypertension. And what we saw was actually pretty good strides um, nationally in the US of improved hypertension control. And then right around 2013, 2014, we saw a decrease in this trend. Um, now, not coincidentally, this may have coincided, or this did coincide, excuse me, with the uh, so-called JNC-8 guidelines. Um, and so we had uh, less hypertension control um, in that scenario. The question becomes, with the 2017 AHA ACC blood pressure guidelines, you know, are we going to see an improvement in hypertension control? Perhaps, we don't know yet. Some of the data coming back very recently suggests maybe not. And then, of course, a global pandemic has not helped. Um, so this is some data from circulation um, that, that we published uh, just about a year ago or so, looking at changes in blood pressure uh, at the start of the pandemic and then throughout 2020. Um, and what we used was a uh, Quest Diagnostics um, does an executive health program or executive health screening for a variety of companies throughout the United States. So it was about 500,000 individuals uh, from all a combination of all 50 states in the US. And then what we looked at was the change in blood pressure on a month to month basis. So what you can see in the blue line on the left is systolic blood pressure changes from month to month between 2018 and 2019. And you don't really see much of a change, okay? 0.5, um, nothing to make, uh, to write home about. And that was pre-pandemic. And then we see that red line, which is comparing each month um, to 2019 to the year 2020. And so January, February, March, no real change, very similar to what was seen in 2019, 2018 compared to 2019. And then we see this significant rise up through the end of 2020 um, with by December, the average individual's blood pressure was two and a half millimeters of mercury higher. And we saw a less prominent but still significant impact on the diastolic blood pressure as well. 
What we also know is that no age group was spared. Um, so, um, and no sex was spared either. Um, so if we look on the left is women, on the right is men. Um, and what we see is even particularly in the older individuals, this real significant increase in blood pressure. And this is multifactorial. Um, there's no question, increased alcohol intake, decreased access to physicians, decreased physical activity, gyms closing, et cetera, but um, not helping the overall state of hypertension control. So the question then becomes, well, what the heck do we do about this? Okay, this is a big problem um, uh, in the US, Canada, nationwide, or excuse me, internationally, really. Um, and so in the United States, what's really been brought forward is a national commitment to improve the care of patients with hypertension. Um, and so the Surgeon General did this, um, Jerome Adams when he was Surgeon General, and then with Janet Wright at the CDC. And so number one, their goal was to ensure or declare hypertension a national priority. They've done that. Number two was really to encourage and utilize community level supports for hypertension, which we know are vitally important. And number three was to optimize the clinical care for these individuals. Um, so no hypertension talk would be complete, particularly with someone coming from the Cleveland Clinic without just going back um, to the Irving Page uh, mosaic theory for hypertension that he proposed um, all the way back in the uh, 1949 in JAMA. Um, and so understanding that hypertension is so multifactorial. Um, and then on the right is the revised version of that. Now, we've come a long way since 1949 in terms of how we think about hypertension, but we know it's not just one factor, okay? Um, there's multiple genetic contributors that we can see here. Um, it's complicated. Um, and then David Robertson from Vanderbilt proposed this in CERC research was the new, um, new mosaic model for hypertension, including a variety of different factors, not just genetics, but sodium intake, sympathetic activation, the microbiome, uh, vascular endothelial dysfunction, uh, oxidative stress, and then of course, uh, renal mechanisms as well. Um, so it's a complicated disease process. I think we all know that. Um, we, we all think about hypertension as being straightforward, but it definitely isn't. Um, the other issue that we run into oftentimes, and this is maybe even more prevalent in the United States than anything else, um, is that everyone has a little bit of a hand in hypertension, okay? Really the quarterback tends to be the uh, internist, family medicine doctors, primary care, physicians. Um, but depending on where you are in the country, you're going to see endocrinologists, perhaps, nephrologists, cardiologists. Um, it's really dependent. Um, and so um, a lot of people tend to dabble, and then there's not as many experts out there that we see. So as many of us know, the current paradigms are the ACD combination, which is an ACE or an ARB, a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, and then a thiazide type diuretic. Um, and then of course, um, as, as we know from the pathway two trial, that the addition of an MRA is the next step in recommended in the resistant hypertension guidelines, um, American hypertension, uh, ACC, AHA guidelines as well. Um, but the question that I'll ask you is, we know this, this data has been around now for over five years, um, is this good enough? Um, and to not to belabor the point, but if we look at more contemporary NHANES data, um, so this is taken from the, uh, the circulation paper that's published every year with uh, heart, um, uh, heart and stroke statistics. Um, when we use a definition of 130 over 80 for hypertension, um, we're looking at less than a quarter of individuals are controlled. And it doesn't matter if you're, if you're white, if you're black, if you're Hispanic, if you're Asian in the United States, um, we're doing a really poor job of controlling hypertension. Um, you know, more than half know they have hypertension, which is an improvement, but control rates are really, really poor. What we also know is that some control rates are based on adherence more than anything else. Um, if we see a 30-year-old individual that's got hypertension in the clinic, um, the first question that they often ask me is, am I gonna be taking meds for the rest of my life? Um, and you know, you might as well presume if you do see that 30-year-old that they're taking their, their hypertension medicines less than half the time, okay? And that's what this top uh, panel shows us is that uh, those younger individuals don't, don't take their medicines very much, okay? And then even when we think about that vulnerable population that's probably the most apt or the most adherent, you know, 65 to 75, st understand their mortality, but still healthy, don't have frailty or multiple other comorbidities, still they're skipping their pills or not taking them um, a quarter of the time. So that's important. Um, and then not surprisingly, as we can see on the bottom as well, the types of medicines we prescribe um, can make a big impact on that as well. So 
receptor blockers, clearly the most adherent, just they have the less side, least side effects and it's a once a day medicine. Once we get to the right of this bottom panel, diuretics, thiazide type diuretics, you know, are three times a day hydralazine, which hopefully no one's doing um, for hypertension, um, we get into problems in that scenario. And so the question that I ask you is, can we move towards a more effective approach? Um, and, and we're gonna answer that in a couple different fashions. Um, and the first thing that I would propose to you is, is there a way to have longer acting medications um, to really have this blood pressure lowering impact that we see? Um, and the nice part is, is that pharmacotherapies are developing at this point um, to really address this. Um, and so many of us may be familiar with uh, short or small interfering RNAs and antisense oligonucleotides, which bring um, a variety of promise to the preventive cardiology space in particular. So um, for those of you unfamiliar, RNA-based therapeutics, they bind to RNA and change the expression of any protein, even those not amenable to our traditional approaches um, involving small molecule drugs. No, I like this slide. Um, I'm not going to belabor the, uh, the basic science of it, but the, the general take home here is that the, the uh, antisense oligonucleotides are on the top, siRNA is on the bottom. So the a ASOs are, um, they're single stranded DNA um, containing about 15 to 30 nucleotides. And ultimately what they do is they inhibit RNA translation, okay? Um, and uh, Pellicarsen is a great example of that from a uh, um, uh, currently being studied, not necessarily in hypertension, but that's in um, elevated lipoprotein A, okay? Um, and then we have uh, siRNAs, which we're probably a little bit more familiar with, um, but that's a double-stranded, okay? Um, uh, non, uh, it's a double-stranded uh, therapy as well um, that we use. Um, now, the majority of RNA-based therapies in the clinical pipeline use um, this siRNA, um, and there's a questionable advantage for blood pressure, okay? Um, in that they likely are more potent in this scenario and have a longer inhibitory effect. Um, and so these are being used in other similar areas, preventive cardiology. Um, the most uh, contemporary example of this is in glycerin and the Orion trials. And so this is, uh, um, induces the cleavage of the mRNA that encodes PCSK9. Its effect or impact lasts about six months. Uh, it's about and over a year. If you get two injections, you get a 50% LDL cholesterol lowering. So it's not like this is something that's um, completely out there. It's being used and it's approved in the US as of December of 2021. So how does that fit into the hypertension space? Well, what's a good target to potentially treat? Um, and so when you think about it, probably the best target that we have is angiotensinogen. Um, and the reason for this is that it is the sole precursor of the potent vasoconstrictor angiotensin II. So if we can stop right at the um, upstream, at the very top of the stream, can we actually induce long-term management? Because the problem is when we think about ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, um, long-term use of these um, is complicated by the RAS escape phenomenon. Um, where there's a counter-regulatory rise that we often see in plasma renin, and we get angiotensin uh, two levels back to their original pretreatment values. Um, so can we target this? Um, and this has been an area of very active and important investigation. Um, so no sort of grand rounds or special rounds would be complete without at least showing some rat or mouse model. So this is, um, this is from only about uh, less than a decade ago, really, looking um, at uh, spontaneously hypertensive rats, um, given this siRNA to target hepatic angiotensinogen, um, mRNA, um, and it was actually maintained with weekly dosing. Um, and so what you can see on the left panel here um, is just the impact um, in, the, uh, in the orange line is this uh, siRNA versus with placebo. The other one is combined with, uh, with candesartan and angiotensin receptor blocker. And we can see pretty significant blood pressure reductions, um, particularly on the right if we look at it um, in a multi-dosed fashion. Um, and so what they really saw was if you give it every week or so, you can see a decrease in, um, in blood pressure and no real change in heart rate. Um, now, of course, at this point, um, efforts were still ongoing to optimize these siRNA designs, um, um, really to get longer term single dose efficacy. Because once a week, maybe not the best for patients, um, you know, can we get a longer, more durable effect? Um, and this is where this comes in, this idea of Galnac conjugation, okay? 
Um, and so this is what many of the therapies, especially the SIRNA, ther SIRNA therapies have done, um, is they've conjugated with a GALNAC, which is a liver targeting ligand to ultimately um, suppress angiotensinogen. Um, it's prolonged, it's got a consistent durable response. Um, there's theoretically the potential for improved adherence um, and you don't have to take it very often. Um, and so when you look at it conjugated here, again in a rat model, we see that the effect lasted out to at least a month um, in this scenario um, uh, when, when we do a similar idea with just the, uh, the siRNA um, and the combination with angiotensin receptor blocker. So that's all great that it happened in the animal model, but what about humans? And, and this is actually what I'm, I'm even uh, particularly interested in. Um, so alnylam pharmaceuticals, um, has a very interesting um, a drug under development called Zylbezerin. It's undergone phase one studies for safety, and it's got multiple phase two trials ongoing, um, particularly the CARDIA trials. And I'm going to talk a little bit about these um, and what to expect in them. Um, so one of their first studies was this relatively small study, 84 individuals with hypertension, um, and they received a variety of uh, different uh, multiple, sort of an ascending doses, excuse me, uh, different doses of uh, this siRNA directed against angiotensinogen. Now, these were individuals that weren't taking blood pressure medicines. Um, blood pressure was uncontrolled, um, and they were relatively young, so between 18 and 65 years of age. Of course, the primary endpoint in any of these studies is going to be safety. Secondary endpoints were decreases in angiotensinogen. Um, and then there was exploratory endpoints for blood pressure. Um, this, they enrolled a pretty similar demographic to what many of us would see in clinic. Blood pressure is right around 140 over 85 to 90, um, and uh, predominantly female um, in the studies. And when you look at their primary endpoint, this idea of safety and tolerability, um, there was no real safety side effects that they had to be worried about. So no significant potassium or creatinine elevations, no ALT elevations, um, and no one had to get off treatment in this scenario. The secondary endpoint of dose-dependent angiotensinogen lowering um, was also really important to see. Um, and so what you can see is placebo at the top in pink, um, and then the different, uh, different doses of zalbezerin, all the way up to 800 milligrams of it. And what we saw was a pretty rapid decrease um, in serum angiotensinogen changes, all the way down to 90 plus percent um, that were durable for almost half a year um, particularly with the uh, with the 800 milligram dose of zalbezerin. Um, so promising in that scenario, um, but how does that actually impact blood pressure? Um, and so what was seen, um, and this is all the 800 milligram uh, dose data, well, this is 200 to 400, 200, 400, 800 milligram. But what the general take home point was after a single dose of the 800 milligram of zalbezerin, um, they saw a mean blood pressure reduction, 24 hour systolic, of greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. Um, so just a phenomenal decrease. Um, and this was seen um, obviously at week eight, week 12, and week 24 as well. And then we saw lesser reductions, but still significant reductions with the 200 and the 400 milligram doses. Um, importantly, what was also seen, and this is not necessarily unexpected given that it is such a long acting medication, was that this effect was durable throughout the 24-hour period as well. Um, uh, Alan Island likes to call it a tonic blood pressure control. I'm not sure where they came up with that, that terminology, but essentially what it's showing is there's not these uh, tr peaks and valleys that we oftentimes see with the oral antihypertensives, uh, particularly in people with um, you know, end-stage kidney disease, et cetera. Um, and so we can see very clear, uh, um, prominent nocturnal dipping um, in these individuals that receive the 800 milligram dose. So very prominent. Um, the general conclusion was that it's well tolerated, of course. There's a dose and dependent and durable angiotensinogen reduction. Um, and that the data further supports quarterly or even every six month dosing. Um, then, of course, the question comes up when we think about blood pressure medicines that may be dosed over a six month period is, well, what about our, 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 our elderly patients, right? Um, blood pressure isn't the only thing that we have going on. You know, maybe you get septic. Maybe there's volume depletion from a gastroenteritis. Perhaps someone's anemic and starts bleeding. Um, so how do we, how does, how would they respond to this durable angiotensinogen suppression? Um, and so there's a couple ways um, that this has been looked at. Um, so this was first was assessing the tolerability of zalbezerin 
during sodium deprivation. Um, and so it was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study. Um, again, these were, these were not elderly patients um, in this scenario, but they were treatment naive, weren't taking any blood pressure medicines. And so what they did was they put them on a low sodium diet, put them on a high sodium diet, put them on their regular diet, and then randomized them to um, zalbizarin versus placebo. And then after um, a few weeks, they put them again back on a low sodium diet um, and then on a high salt diet. And saw what the what the difference was and what the changes. And I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, very similar endpoints to what we saw in the prior study as well. Um, and so these were, um, it wasn't a large number of patients, but it was enough to get a sense of what we're seeing. So in the left panel here, we can see on the left side of the left panel, what we can see um, is that when uh, patients are uh, taking a low sodium diet, clearly blood pressure goes down. We saw that in both the placebo and the zalbizarin groups. Okay, uh, systolic and diastolic. When you put them on a high sodium diet, it increases. Um, and then at this point, D1, they received zalbizarin or placebo. And what we see is this really significant or profound blood pressure decrease in individuals that were sodium depleted, so on a low sodium diet. But that was recovered when they had a higher sodium content, um, suggesting that that's one mechanism to rescue these individuals if it simply comes down to too much or too aggressive blood pressure lowering in this scenario. Now, I don't think anyone's ready to propose that these long-acting long medications would be used um, as a one-off basis as, or as a sort of single agent. So it's also important to think about how they could be used in the setting, particularly of angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, we know the data for ACEs and ARBs together is not good. We know the data for direct renin inhibitors with ACEs and ARBs is not good. So what happens when you give zalbizarin with um, herbicertin as well? Um, and so in this, this was all individuals that received 800 milligrams of zalbizarin. They got a 24-hour ABPM. Um, and then those that still had blood pressure above 120 systolic on their 24-hour monitor, they received 300 milligrams of herbicertin once a day, um, and then 24-hour ABPM was repeated. And so what we can see um, from the, the initial period where they were not receiving um, herbicertin, um, so those individuals that ended up um, only receiving zalbizarin, so they had a robust response, similar to what I told you earlier, they had greater than 22, or they had exactly 22 millimeter mercury systolic blood pressure reduction with it. Um, um, and then those individuals who ended up getting zalbizarin, so their systolic blood pressure remained above 170, they had a less robust response. So they were 7.7 .7, um, decrease. However, when you added the angiotensin receptor on top of that, you essentially doubled the lowering, okay? So you got a total of about 14, um, 14 to 15 um, millimeters of mercury systolic blood pressure lowering. Um, uh, and then you know, similar idea, doubling of the lowering when you look at the diastolic blood pressure. So that's a really um, interesting new therapy. They're coming out with emerging data um, uh, as in the, in the coming months, um, I'm sure. Now, the other option that we have here is not an siRNA, but an antisense oligonucleotide. Um, and so this is from Ionis Pharmaceuticals. Um, and they've completed one phase two study, and they've completed a couple of phase, uh, excuse me, um, a couple of phase two studies as well. I won't take you through the phase one study, but um, the, uh, the phase two studies are, are, are relatively interesting. So the first one was individuals um, that uh, had controlled hypertension on at least two medicines. They were taken off all their blood pressure medicines and they were randomized two to one to this uh, weekly subcutaneous injection with a loading dose at day three. Um, and then the primary endpoint, uh, similar to what we saw in the Zalbizarin trials, was angiotensinogen reduction. Um, and of course, you know, in these smaller studies, only 25 patients was empowered to see blood pressure reduction. And they actually published um, all of this in uh, JAK, uh, Basic Translational Science, um, about a year, a year and a half ago or so. So these individuals were in their 60s. Um, typically, blood pressures were you know, 150 over mid 80s to 90s. Um, so nothing that would be out of the ordinary, uh, normal serum creatinines. What was seen was um, after the, with this weekly uh, subcutaneous injection that we see, um, pretty significant angiotensinogen reduction, um, not to the level that we saw with zalbizarin, okay? Now we're more in the 50 to 75% range, not in that 90 plus percent range that we saw with the siRNA. Um, 
Um, importantly, they didn't see any clinical meaningful changes in potassium or GFR, okay? Granted, it's a smaller study. And they saw about a six millimeter mercury um, placebo uh, subtracted reduction in systolic blood pressure in that scenario. So not a huge amount, but not an insignificant amount either. If you put it head to head against renal denervation, that's about what we've seen from some of the recore and the, um, the, uh, the spiral data as well. Um, so, um, and, and then some of these individuals had a particularly robust response. Um, at least a third of them had a greater than um, uh, 15% millimeter reductions, uh, systolic blood pressure reduction. Their second phase two trial was again a similar number of individuals, but these individuals were already taking blood pressure med medicines. Again, randomized two to one to um, active ingredient versus placebo. Uh, primary endpoint was the same. Um, we saw a very similar patient um, population that was enrolled in this trial. Um, and so what was shown here was similar idea, okay? You got this reduction in angiotensinogen, which appears to correlate quite well with systolic blood pressure reduction. Um, and, and again, we saw a very similar decrease, okay? We definitely saw more placebo decrease here um, in terms of blood pressure reduction, but again, you're in that sort of six to seven millimeter of mercury range um, when you look at placebo subtractive numbers. Um, what I oftentimes like to look at, particularly in these hypertension studies that are smaller, so your phase two um, studies is the waterfall plots as well, and see who really, or not um, in this scenario. So systolic blood pressure is on the top, um, diastolic blood pressure is on the right. On the left is the monotherapy trial. So that means they've taken off all of their blood pressure medicines. On the right is the add-on trial. So they were on two to three medicines. And what we can see is you had you know, a certain percent of individuals with a pretty significant, the majority of individuals out to the right here um, had greater than 10 millimeter mercury reduction in systolic blood pressure. Not sure what's going on with the individual that had a 35 over 27 increase in their blood pressure, but you know, understanding that we see um, really a, a nice and um, you know, somewhat predictable response in these individuals. Um, the general take home here is there's more to come in this scenario. We'll see, um, but it definitely presents an, an option that's um, different than saying, eh, just have another pill, um, add another pill on top of it. So coming back to this question of, can we move towards a more effective approach? Um, the other issue is, is, is there are newer oral options available. So it's really interesting. If you look at the American Heart Association um, scientific sessions, which are taking place um, uh, uh, this coming weekend, um, about a third of all of the trials presented are going to be hypertension-based trials. Um, so of course we have the, the VA's um, uh, chlorthalidone versus hydrochlorothiazide trial, which will be interesting to see. It's about 10 to 15,000 patients. Um, there's some um, community level support, some mindfulness based. So those, those will all be interesting to see. But probably the session that uh, I'm very interested in or the most interested in are some of the newer options that we have to treat hypertension. So there's the FRESH study looking at aminopeptidase A inhibitors um, in treatment resistant hypertension. We're not gonna talk about that today, but that's uh, an interesting one. Um, there's the precis precision study, um, which is a dual endothelin receptor antagonist. Um, I'm not as excited about that one because I know we're going to induce a lot of edema as we know from prior uh, trials, but uh, their press release back in the spring said that it met its primary endpoint. So it'll be interesting to see. What I think is most interesting is the Brighton study. Um, and this is looking at uh, Baxterstat, which is an aldosterone synthase inhibitor. Um, and so this is a phase two randomized double blind uh, trial for treatment resistant hypertension. So we'll get more information on it. But the big thing that it comes down to is can we identify these hypertension phenotypes, okay? Everyone likes to put hypertension patient, patients with hypertension, um, primary hypertension or secondary hypertension and really create that dichotomy. But we know from emerging data, it's not that simple, particularly when it comes to autonomous aldosterone production in primary hypertension. And this has been a major focus really over the past five years is doing a better job at identifying those individuals. You know, we all learned in medical school, you know, look at the um, aldo to renin ratio and that'll be your, your guide. You know, it's not that simple, okay? You know, even at a Cleveland Clinic, if we, we measure direct renin concentration. So if your direct renin concentration is suppressed, 
you can't get a ratio. It's below the lower limit of the assay. So we have to be able to interpret this and think about this. And we also know that this is a very significant percentage of individuals. So how does this work? Well, um, we have angiotensinogen ultimately um, um, and typically would induce aldosterone production. But if adrenal glands okay, are having autonomous aldosterone production, which we know doesn't noma, it can be from micronodules, it can be from bilateral hyperplasia, there's a spectrum of disease there, it creates a non-suppressible state um, when, when you're salt loaded. So we still have this excess aldosterone production, which of course causes us to hold on to sodium, lose potassium, okay, extracellular volume expansion, and then ultimately create hypertension or um, uh, result in elevated blood pressures, per, uh, perhaps um, inducing hypertension. Um, now, this is a great um, paper from Annals of Internal Medicine published just a couple years ago, about two and a half years ago. Data taken from four major hypertension centers um, around, the, around the United States and that had 24-hour urine aldo aldosterones performed in a variety of individuals. And so they were separated, these individuals, by untreated normal tension, untreated stage one and stage two hypertension, and then our treatment-resistant hypertension individuals. Um, and so when we're thinking about this autonomous aldosterone production, um, the first thing is we got to identify patients with overt primary aldosteronism. Because if we look at this data, um, at almost 25% of treatment-resistant uh, uh, treatment-resistant hypertension patients have um, primary aldosteronism, and even in our stage one and stage two hypertension individuals, we're talking between 15 and 22%. And then what's even more interesting is this untreated normal tension. We have 10% of individuals that meet diagnostic criteria, um, uh, which here was uh, 12 micrograms uh, uh, per 24 hours, okay, um, what to, uh, to be diagnosed with primary aldosteronism. Um, and we don't do a very good job at this. We actually do a really poor job. Um, so as a really a, almost a follow along six months later, what was done in looking at the VA system was looking at patients with hypertension, with apparent treatment resistant hypertension, and how many of those were actually tested for primary aldosteronism. And now it were patients with stage four, stage five chronic kidney disease, or those individuals that didn't have resistant hypertension. But what it showed was only 1.6% of this cohort, which was over 200,000 individuals that had resistant hypertension with mild or no kidney disease, less than 2% were actually tested for primary aldosteronism. Um, and of those that were tested for primary aldosteronism, about 12% had it. Um, and the sobering fact that I like to share with my um, cardiology colleagues is that um, we are no better than anyone at testing for it, okay? The nephrologists are better at it. The, the uh, endocrinologists are better at it. Of course, we would presume that hypokalemia, higher systolic blood pressure, you're more likely to treat. But, um, you know, um, if, if you look, if the sort of the baseline um, is primary care physicians, um, cardiologists are very similar um, in that scenario. So, um, so if you ruled out primary aldosteronism, which um, hopefully many of you will start checking it a little bit more. Then the question is, well, what are those individuals that have inappropriately elevated aldosterone? Um, so this, i.e. this autonomous aldosterone production. Um, and our best data for why this would be beneficial comes from the Pathway 2 trial. So this was published in The Lancet in 2015, looking at the soprolol versus doxazosin versus spironolactone as that fourth line therapy. And that's what led to a lot of the changes in the resistant hypertension guidelines where spironolactone is our, our fourth line therapy. But in individuals with autonomous aldosterone production, of course, their renin is going to be suppressed. So what are we going to see? Well, what we saw in the pathway two trial is that you get between a 15 and 20 millimeter of mercury reduction in systolic blood pressure. Um, so just a really significant. Now, you get it even when your renin is elevated. There's no question about it. And that's why spironolactone is good for most patients, but really profound blood pressure lowering um, in this scenario. And how does that compare well, if you look at the average half dose or standard dose of a, of a blood pressure lowering medicine, you're getting between seven and nine millimeters of mercury uh, systolic blood pressure reduction, okay? So you're essentially giving them two, two medicines for the price of one when you identify these individuals um, with uh, autonomous aldosterone production. Um, now, I will make the note 
that of those individuals that have suppressed renin, not all of them, of course, are going to be with elevated aldosterone. Some will be more the um, uh, uh, suppressed aldo and suppressed renin um, in this scenario. So the, the question always comes up when I bring this up is, well, why don't we just use more mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists? Um, and I'll preface this. I'm not going to talk a lot about them. Um, I think we should be using more of them. Um, there's no question about that. Um, however, um, we're all familiar with the patients that come in, okay, um, that, that have been on it for two, three months. And they say, oh, man, doc, my, my breasts are sore. Um, and I'll tell you, this is not limited to, um, to men. I've seen it in women as well, interestingly. Um, so you have those estrogen-like effects. Um, and then, of course, we're going to have issues like hyperkalemia, particularly in patients with, um, with CKD. Um, so what's the next option or a good option for that? Well, um, what I, I think is probably the most promising treatment, as I, as I alluded to earlier, are aldosterone synthase inhibitors. Um, so this is not a new concept. Um, LCI 699, which was um, uh, uh, developed uh, by Novartis, is an example of it. But that development was ceased about uh, 10 to 12 years ago. There's multiple studies underway looking at this. Now, there's clearly going to be a role in the treatment of primary aldosteronism, but uh, but I'm going to talk about it more in the, the context of your, your run-of-the-mill hypertension here or resistant hypertension. Um, so the, the big thing that we run into is if you can see in the red text here, aldosterone synthase inhibitors, um, what you want to do is you want to have an impact on CYP11B2, okay, which would ultimately decrease aldosterone production. However, um, CYP11B2 is 95% homologous um, to CYP11B1 which is in, impacts uh, cortisol production, okay? Um, and so the goal with these medicines is to create an uh, aldosterone synthase inhibitor that specifically inhibits CYP11B2 without affecting B1, okay? So you don't blunt cortisol. Um, and so that was actually, and we'll talk about that, but that was the downfall of LCI 699. So this was uh, uh, the phase two uh, double-blind randomized trial. Uh, published in circulation, as I said, about um, now 11 years ago or so, looking at different doses of this aldosterone synthase inhibitor and compared it to a plurinone. Um, and so it was over an eight-week double-blind period. Um, and so what you can see on the left panel here, um, placebos in gray, um, the yellow bars are the reduction in, uh, in blood pressure that we saw with LCI 699 and different doses, okay? Uh, diastolic blood pressures on the top, systolic blood pressures on the bottom, and then a pleuronone is in red. So number one, a pleuronone was better than LCI 699. Um, so we did see that, um, but there was significantly lowering and theoretically, you know, potentially less side effects associated with it. Um, what they saw also was uh, that, was so those were, um, uh, office blood pressures, 24-hour blood pressures, similar, okay, in that sort of 7 to 5 millimeter mercury, uh, 7 over 5 millimeter mercury reduction, but it's variable. Um, and so in this scenario, I think it would have been worthwhile pursuing, even though it wasn't quite as good as a plurinone at lowering blood pressure. Um, however, the big downfall, excuse me, was that um, ACTH stimulation of cortisol was suppressed in one out of five of these individuals, okay? Um, and so it was attributable in, in part to the CYP11B1 um, suppression or inhibition. Um, and so the question became, would this impair recovery in these clinical stress-mediated events? And um, no one had the stomach to answer that question, okay, particularly for the drug development and hypertension. Um, and so uh, that, was, uh, that development was abandoned. But what the authors um, stated, and appropriately so, was the development of these more selective aldosterone synthase inhibitors um, may um, leave uh, normal ACTH stimulation intact or a stimulation of cortisol intact. Um, and so that leads us to an era now where we have more selective aldosterone synthase inhibitors. So there's a variety of these being studied. Um, the, the, the one I alluded to earlier that's being presented at AHA is the Syncor product. Um, uh, and so they're doing a few studies, which we'll talk about. Um, and then, um, then another one that's very interesting um, and, and in development is Mineralis Therapeutics MLS 101, which we'll talk about as well. Um, and then there's a variety of them. Um, and these are not um, these are not small endeavors, of course, right? Now this slide is actually a little bit a little bit older. Um, so Syncor and they raised a bunch of money for their Series B financing. It actually went public earlier this year um, with an IPO for just under two hundred million dollars. And then Mineralis, another one, 
um, they just did a, a Series B funding for about $118 million. And these, let's just be clear, these are one drug companies, okay? These are not Novartis, Amgen, um, uh, GSK, those places, okay? Um, so they've got all their eggs in this basket. Um, so what's the advantage of these? Well, the advantage again is the selectivity, okay? Um, much more so, you can see MLS 101, which is the Mineralis product, Syncor, which is on the, on the right, both much more selective for CYP11 B2 in this scenario. Other differences between those are the half-lives, okay? Um, longer than the LCI 699, that, that prior Novartis product. Um, and there may be pluses or minuses to that. Um, the Syncor is uh, about 29 hours. Uh, MLS 101 is it's 8 to 10. So you can imagine going both ways with the half-life, right? Long half-life, more effective duration of action, um, you know, better blood pressure lowering over the 24-hour period. The alternative is true. What if you run into problems with hyperkalemia, et cetera? Um, so, you know, to be determined in this scenario. Um, so as I alluded to earlier, the Brighton study, which we'll get data from in about a week, actually it's exactly a week, um, they present on Monday, um, is a phase two double-blind placebo-controlled dose ranging study of the efficacy in treatment-resistant hypertension. Um, so you know, not enough to get to the level of FDA approval at this point, but um, you know, potentially promising, presumably, um, to move on to their phase three pivotal trials in that scenario. What they're also doing is they're doing um, a study in individuals that are only on one blood pressure medicine as well, okay? Call that the HALO trial, um, comparing it to placebo. Um, I think that's important as well, because I think many of us can imagine, you know, th seeing this in a fixed dose combination pill, which is recommended in all our guidelines across the world now as starting, you know, could you combine this with a thiazide type diuretic? You know, I think the more interesting question could you combine it with something like an SGLT2 inhibitor down the road, okay? There is some more contemporary data suggesting that um, uh, that when we combine a, take a plurinone and an SGLT2 inhibitor as well, we get less hyperkalemia and more efficient blood pressure lowering with both of them. So to be determined um, in that scenario. Um, what about this MLS 101? Um, so they would, the company would claim that it's more selective, better potency, superior. We'll see. Okay. They have a phase one study that's been done um, and completed. Um, they've completed their phase two target HTN study, which we were a site for um, at Cleveland Clinic. Um, and so this was a dose ranging study. I can't tell you a ton about the results because it hasn't been published yet. Um, presumably we're going to publish it at ACC um, this coming year. What it did though, which is sort of interesting, a little bit different from your all comers in hypertension, was it phenotyped. Um, the true low renin hypertension with elevated aldosterone. Now, that's not a new concept, okay? John Lara worked on his entire career um, looking at that and seeing, does it make a difference? I don't know if it will. It'll be interesting to see, or are we going to see the impact very similarly um, in certain groups of individuals? We'll see. All right. So can we move towards a more effective approach? Well, what's the most effective, potentially? Um, could it be gene editing? All right. Um, now that's a little, you know, out there. That's not five years away. That's that's more like ten. But when we think about gene editing for hypertension, we want to be efficient. We want to be reliable, and we want to be precise. Okay. Um, and the nice part is, is that we have therapies to do that. Okay. CRISPR-Cas9 based gene ablation um, is a, you know, could it be a single sustained treatment for hypertension? even perhaps a cure for hypertension. Now, I think that's a bridge too far to say at this point, particularly given some of the, uh, the multifactorial nature that we know, um, but could it help more than anything else? Um, and so there is some more, um, there's some, some data here um, looking at this. This is an animal model as well, um, looking at uh, uh, blood pressure reduction again in spontaneously hypertensive rats and normal tensive controls. And we see if you disrupt angiotensinogen via uh, CRISPR-Cas9 um, uh, methods, um, what you saw was um, on the top line of the panel there, angiotensinogen reduction in plasma. So similar to what we saw with the siRNAs and ASOs. Um, and so pretty significant um, across all these different um, measurements. Um, what was also seen, and this was in uh, five-week-old spontaneously hypertensive rats, was that it significantly slowed, uh, excuse me, slowed the normal development and hypertension of these individuals, or excuse me, these rats, um, over a prolonged period of time. You know, we're talking up to nine weeks here, okay? Um, and then when they, the comment made in the manuscript is actually they saw lower blood pressure up to a year later 
Um, so really prominent and really interesting. Um, what about individuals? So those were um, those were rats that hadn't developed hypertension yet. What about established hypertension? What happens to them? Um, well, there was a rapid and progressive decrease in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure that was maintained over that nine week period as well, both in ma uh, male and female rats. Um, in normal tensive individuals, we saw a little bit of a decrease in blood pressure, but it was relatively modest and lasted six weeks. Um, similar to that question that we asked about elderly individuals, you know, what happens in the setting of sodium deprivation or uh, you know, volume depletion, things like that. Um, what was shown was that um, disruption of hepatic angiotensinogen gene was sufficient to control the hypertension, but didn't affect the homeostatic response to a sodium load, okay? Um, to sodium depletion, excuse me, or a diuretic um, with like furosemide. Um, so, um, so we would expect that it was lower in these gene edited um, at rats, but it didn't approach the frankly hypotensive levels. Um, so, uh, so really uh, the, the next frontier for hypertension management. And of course, this also is not without precedent in cardiovascular medicine. Uh, many of us are probably familiar with Verve Therapeutics, okay, and their CRISPR-Cas9 therapy um, for PCSK9. And then more recently, they've released some data about angiopoietin-like three um, inhibitors. Um, and so this is this is their um, uh, monkey data looking at really a one-and-done shot for uh, LDL cholesterol lowering. Um, if you're going to lower PCSK9, you'd lower LDL cholesterol. Um, by about 60 percent so almost a one-time shot for um, that would be equivalent to our pcsk9s um, evolocumab and alirocumab right now now this is a proof of concept um, they actually are undergoing uh, phase one studies right now in humans they enrolled their first patient verve did um, in new zealand um, in this phase one study a couple months ago now so um very um uh, important and you know the future of preventive cardiology um, and, uh, for uh, dyslipidemia, but then also thinking about how we can apply that to hypertension. Um, now, in the last five minutes here, I want to also say and just wrap up that even though we have new pharmacotherapies, which are important, I, I think that we know that we're struggling with hypertension management. Um, you know, we have device-based therapies, which is a uh, talk unto itself, such as renal denervation, um, which likely will be FDA approved within the next year or so. Um, but we still can't forget the basics. Okay, um, My mentor, George Backris, um, would always say, and then I've taken it forward to tell patients when we talk about hypertension management, it's not like cholesterol. Okay, Cholesterol, you know, I say about 60 to 75% um, genetically mediated. Okay, You can do some with lifestyle and it's important, but you need the medicines. Hypertension, it's the other way around oftentimes, okay? 70% lifestyle, 30% medications. So we can't forget to educate our patients about that. Um, and even at a large hypertension center like Cleveland Clinic, I still have to educate all my patients. They've been through three, four, five doctors. They've been to you know, um, Mayo Clinic. They've been everywhere else. Um, I still have to educate them on what does a low sodium diet actually mean, okay? Um, that's a question we ask everyone. You know, have you, do you have a specific amount of sodium that you limit yourself to? And I show them a similar chart. I actually give them on their patient handout a printout of all these lifestyle factors in the table taken directly from the ACC guidelines. You know, how much these lifestyle factors impact hypertension. So, you know, losing weight, gets you on average five millimeters of mercury, getting to an ideal weight, just a low sodium diet, five to six millimeters of mercury. This is the dash, this apple represents the dash diet, um, about 11. Um, and so, and these are all additive as well. So these have to be part of our, um, uh, our armamentarium. Um, it'll be interesting to see when we look at the, the gentleman on the left here, who's a little rotund, you know, how some of our newer therapies for obesity ultimately impact this as well, okay? Our um, terzepatides. Um, or some aglutides, um, but you know, those are um, other issues as well. So just focusing on these is really important. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really important about hypertension and just preventive cardiology in general, medicine in general, for goodness sakes, is this is a team sport. Um, we can't do it alone as physicians, okay? We need to make sure, engage with dietitians, 
engage with our other you know nurses pharmacists um uh, they're so important particularly to uh, actually particularly to hypertension management we can show numerous community-based studies showing the impact of pharmacy-led interventions for blood pressure um, and then also exercise physiologists okay they play a big role um, with our, our patients at cleveland clinic get them in there for an exercise prescription um, to really round out all cardiovascular health and blood pressure reduction um, so I'd like to end with the following take home points. We know that hypertension is a complex disease. Um, we need to do a better job treating hypertension. Um, and you know, I, I don't think anyone would argue with that anywhere across the world. New pharmacological and device-based therapies have promise um, and uh, they're very interesting and, and you're gonna hear more about them, as I said, in the next week or so. Um, there's gonna be a lot of, a lot of uh, publicity around them, um, but, even in this uh, milieu of increasing technology um, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, future therapies, the basics still matter. We need to educate people about lifestyle um, to really control their blood pressure and get them where we need to be, which is reducing uh, strokes and heart attacks. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'd be more than happy to take any questions.